evening, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. Hope you're well. Hope you've had a good day. Hopefully you're ready for about an hour of trying to get you ready for your first GP post coming coming up for a couple of weeks for a couple of you guys. Pooja, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Good evening, everyone. Looking forward to sharing some of our insights with you all this evening. So we've got a jam-packed webinar ahead of us. Please say hello. Please let us know if you can hear us. Let us know if you can see the screen. Please do give us some feedback just to make sure that you are there and you are hearing us okay. Fantastic. Hi, Rishma. First, we will say hello. Thank you so much. Hope you had a good day. How was your day? What have you been up to? Have you been working? Are you on leave? What have you been up to this day? Hi, Kahinde. How are you doing? Good to see you back. Good to see some names that I recognize from our previous webinars. Hi, Natasha. How are you doing? Good. Lots of people say they can hear us, they can see us. If I change the screen, have you seen that change? Just give me a yes, just so I know that you are on board with us. Hi, Stephanie. How are you doing? Hi, Kahinde again. Fantastic. So it looks like people can hear us and people can see us. Hi, Rasemi. Hi, Melanie. Hi, Elsa. Good to see you guys logging in. We have around 300 and 15 registered today. So we're going to give people a few more minutes just to get back on board. I can see people on the website right now trying to log in. So I want to give them a couple of minutes, but welcome everybody. And welcome to Tommy from Medics Money. Tommy, are you there? Yeah, hi. Uh, great, to, great to be here and uh, looking forward to tonight's webinar. Super excited to Guys, can you uh, give me a bit if you can hear Tommy? We can't hear Tommy at the moment. So please let me know if you can. How about now? Can you hear me now? Okay. So Tommy, everyone can hear you, but we can't. So we're going to try and figure out why we can't hear you. <laughs> Intriguing. Well, I can yes, hear you can. loud and clear. So, um, and uh, great that everyone else can hear me. Yeah, Could make it interesting, you. but we'll see how we go. We've got you. Brilliant. Now we've got you. We're just going to pop the music up. That's, that's why we couldn't hear you. Fantastic. Welcome, Tommy. Thank you so much for taking your evening out and spending it with us. We're hopefully going to offer our listeners a huge amount of value in terms of financial advice, but also some other things that often people ask us about post-CCT. And it's that kind of time when people start to ask these questions that perhaps in training, they didn't really think too much about. I certainly didn't when I was a trainee. So really thank you for coming on board and hope you can share us some good tips. Absolutely. Yeah, looking forward to it. Um, four years ago now, I was in your position of the, you know, finishing uh, GP training and kind of remember it well, but I definitely feeling quite unprepared. So if I had something like this, that would have definitely helped me. So yeah, unprepared, I think is the, is the word for sure. Pooja, remember your last few weeks? Yeah, excited, definitely looking forward to it, but also anxious about that first day of being a proper GP. So definitely feeling it. Good. So just so we know who our audience is and who we know we're targeting to, can you just give me a number, one, two, three, or four? One, if you're finishing in two weeks, two, if you're a trainee finishing later on this year, three, if you're a trainee finishing beyond this year, and four, if you're already a GP. Okay, so lots of numbers coming in. So we have a, a mix of all numbers, really, lots of ones. So people finishing in a couple of weeks, we've got a, a, quite a few fours on, so already GP, which is excellent and some GP 20s who are in ST1 and ST2 as well. So a huge range um, in terms of experience, I guess. So hopefully we can add value to you wherever you are in your career scheme. A lot of people saying pending results. Some of you have done RCA recently, so you're waiting for results, AKT results, et cetera. So yes, a stressful time for many, but it's good to know we've got a big range on board. So can I just let you know where, where are you based at the moment? Where in the UK? Let us know what the spread is of you. So we can see where we're talking to. So we have Sheffield, we have Cambridge, Birmingham, Leicester, London, Blackpool, Coventry, Northwest, Bedfordshire, Birmingham, Notts, Stevenage, London, 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 South London, Manchester, Isle of Arran, fantastic, West Yorkshire, Manchester, East of England, South London, Northwest, all over the UK, Scotland, fantastic, Inverness, Belfast, Cambridge, so lots and lots and lots of different places in the UK. Tommy, whereabouts are you based at the moment? I am based on the south coast, kind of between Portsmouth and Brighton. Okay, fantastic. So if anyone is around that area, then you may well know Tommy already. Right, so a quick introduction then. So some of you guys have come through Medics Money and, and heard of us on the webinar through these guys. But for those of you who follow our webinars, have been with us over the summer, a quick intro to Medics Money. You may have heard of them and seen them in various places on, online. Um, you're kind of everywhere at the moment. Um, Tommy, your, your little logo, we see all over the place, but they're two super guys, two super GPs. Ed is not around today, is that right, Tommy? 
Yeah, Ed is CCTing in two weeks, so he's making the most of his remaining annual leave and is currently holidaying in the exotic location of the Isle of Wight. So, yep, fantastic. And Tony, <laughs> what about yourself? A bit of a background about yourself would be great so people know a bit about yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I'm a GP partner. Uh, I also do some GP with special interest in dermatology, and I am the co-founder of Medics Money, uh, also a husband and father of three. Um, so yeah, me and Ed run Medics Money, and as I said, Ed is a GPSD3. He is CCTing in two weeks' time. But before uh, doing medicine, Ed, or still is, a chartered accountant and a chartered tax advisor, and he worked in the city of London for nine years. So it's a kind of a unique skill set. And what we do is we give you the financial CPD that you probably never had. So we don't receive much training in uh, finances during our medical education. Um, and as a result, we notice that a lot of our colleagues struggle with money. So we set up Medics Money to answer all your financial questions. Um, and we'll get into some of that later today. Yeah, absolutely. I think I remember coming out of training myself and I hadn't really thought about money at all, to be honest. And it's, uh, you know, you're in training and you just kind of get through the hoops and want to pass your exams and you can think that everything else will take care of itself. And then suddenly it's an area that either you start to think about and get a bit worried because you don't know much or people just kind of don't think about it. And then they start having realizing that, gosh, there's money issues that come up later on um, soon into being a GP. So it's really good to have you on board. And I'm sure you're going to be offering some really good advice later on in the webinar itself. A bit of background about us two, if you haven't met us before, I'm Aman and my wife, Pooja. We're both GPs. I'm now in full-time medical education. I've had lots of medical education roles. And Pooja? Hi, everyone. Yes, so I've had a background in medical politics, various roles within the BMA. Uh, I've also held some roles with HEE. So hopefully trying to bring some of that knowledge to you guys this evening. And please, guys, do keep it interactive. So if you have any questions, please do fire them in the chat box. Um, we'll try and answer them quickly if they're ones that we can be answered quickly there and then. But otherwise, we will come back at the end and make sure we answer all questions. But we try and keep them to the end if they're going to be long, just to increase the flow of the webinar. So what is this webinar all about then? So we try to think about the best way to try and make it interactive and offer as much value as possible. So what we decided was to come up with four questions on each side that we asked of each other early on and questions that we had that we would have asked had we thought about things earlier on. So we're going to ask Tommy four questions that we thought were important and questions that people come to me and Pooja about that we don't really have answers to and vice versa. Tom is going to try and ask us a bit about things that perhaps we can offer value for. So we're going to try and cover things we wish we knew, we'd known before CCT, looking at some of the common mistakes and how to avoid them that I often see people making when they first jump into the world of general practice. Um, some key financial starting points that Tommy's going to talk about how to get off onto the right foot, both in finances and in terms of career, and talk a bit about this kind of buzzword portfolio career that people um, are talking more and more about these days. And always with our webinars, we try and offer some offers. So later on the webinar, I'll be giving 10 codes for 20% off our post CCT Max online course. I'll be showing you what that's all about later on and 10% off our flash revision cards that surprisingly a lot of GPs have started to use just to keep up to date with guidelines. So we'll be giving these codes out later on in the webinar. So in one quick word, then, just to get a, a gauge a bit of the mood in terms of the people on in the webinar, in one word, how are you feeling about being an independent GP? And if we've got GPs who are on the other side, please give us one word in terms of how you remember feeling when you're about to make that leap into your first independent roles. So we have excited, nervous, imposter, anxious, imposter, um, anxious, 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 nervous, excited, hopeful. Yeah, so lots of lost. Okay, so these are all words that resonated with, with me and Pooja, I guess, yourself, and I guess Tommy as well. Um, lots of excitedness, which is great, lots of positivity, lots of words like buzzing and happy, but also lots of nervousness and anxiety. And I think that's the kind of balance that I remember myself, Pooja. Yeah, as I said, um, that nervousness about finally going solo and not having a supervisor or anyone to turn to, but still being excited about finally making your own choices. And Tommy, yourself? Yeah, I remember just thinking that I needed to know everything and I definitely didn't. Um, so, yeah, uh, it was kind of exciting. It was definitely really intimidating. Um, yeah. And something like this would have really helped me. But uh, it's mm -hmm. it's a great job. And four years later, I'm still alive. So it's, yeah, it's all good. good. I and, can't uh, see the back, actually, but um, yeah. 
Uh, big bad world is what Rosemary's put in. I think that's um, a great way of summing it up. Okay, so again, what worries or concerns you most about completing training right now? Again, just give me one or two words, guys, if you can. What is the major worry or concern that you have? I'm going to see if we can answer some of those things in the webinar tonight. So what have we got? So no supervisor. Yep, people are saying no supervisor on my own, being isolated, getting sued, uh, making a mistake, getting the right job, getting paid work, no locum jobs, getting a job in a short period of time, time management. Okay, so again, lots of things, being alone. Again, things that I certainly had in my mind when I first made that jump. Um, don't want to waste opportunities. We'll talk about those later on, finding locum jobs, COVID and the job market. Yeah, so lots and lots of things that are, are very time timely at the moment. Pooja, anything else to add from yourself, what you were thinking? No, yeah, just trying to find enough work at the time. So I can definitely resonate with those of you who are feeling like that at the moment. Okay, fine. So, Tommy, over to you. We're going to start with the questions that you're going to pose to us. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm not being antisocial. I can't see the chat, but uh, you can just uh, feedback on any chat that's relevant for me. But uh, yeah, so let's jump into, uh, as it says, um, I know that you both worked as locum, so, and that can be really intimidating well straight out of CCT. So what was the most challenging thing that you found about being a locum GP? Well, for me personally, I CCT'd with a six-month-old baby, so I chose to locum for flexibility. And so for me, there were two issues that I found really challenging. Um, I didn't get to alter the time of sessions being offered in the locum market, so I would apply for a session and work that session. And sometimes I had to let go of work because it didn't work around my childcare arrangements. So things such as evening shifts. And then my second biggest worry was around, well, my little one was starting nursery. If uh, she was unwell, how, how would I go about canceling a shift? I, di I didn't know what situation would occur if I had to do that, or if I myself fell ill, what would I do? Um, these sort of concerns that um, I found really challenging at the time. So I think for, for myself, I jumped into to locum work as a lot of GP trainees do, I suppose, early on. And I found a couple of things quite challenging. I didn't really expect it to be challenging. I guess it's the kind of talked about thing. Certainly when I was at VTS, everyone was thinking about, well, you know, what are you going to do when you first finish? Well, do a few locums, get used to the scene. I think it's just quite a common thought that everybody had. But when I jumped in, the risk element really hit me. I remember doing my first locum in a practice that I'd never worked in before. And obviously I've, I've been working in a, in a training practice for a year with a lot of support and suddenly, and, and they actually got me my first locum job a couple of days after I finished training. I remember walking into this practice and just thinking, well, I don't know anybody here. I don't know the, the, the staff here. I don't know the other GPs here. I don't know the background of the patients here. And it was just such a stressful experience trying to learn not just a new system, but also new routes in terms of getting people from the waiting room and how the calling system works. And there's a lot of things I learned from that in terms of making sure I've understood these before I hit a new practice. But I certainly remember feeling a little bit overwhelmed and I, and I worried about risk because I was seeing patients that I didn't know. And again, I've been very used to seeing people that I'd seen five, six, seven times before in my training practice and suddenly seeing people brand new. Although I'd done it in out of hours before, it was just a different experience. And that I found uh, really challenging early on. Another thing I found challenging is as soon um, after I started working as a local, we were looking at moving to a new place. And the one thing I hadn't really thought about was things like mortgages and how difficult it would be when you're sitting in a locum role um, and people are looking at you in terms of gauging whether this person is mortgageable. So that was something that I clearly had a, some queries and, and doubts on and worries about that, that I didn't expect. Um, and things I think Tom is going to talk about some of these a little later on just to try and make the most of it. So Locuming certainly isn't for everybody. It, 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 when I was, a, I was a program director and everybody at VTS, including when I was a trainee, but also after that, we're talking about being a locum, but it's not for everybody. And some people find it really difficult. So it's about trying to gauge and balance whether you're the right sort of person to think about doing locuming, because it can put a lot of stress on people. There are some pros, of course, a lot of flexibility and you know, you choose when you work, you choose how much you work, you choose how often you work. And it's got a lot of pros from that angle. I think that's the, the reason that a lot of people try and jump into locum because it's that flexibility that you haven't had for many years in your career prior to that. Obviously, you can set your rates. You're an independent business. You can charge as you like. Of course, you're going to charge yourself outside of the market if you go too far. But you have some flexibility in terms of what your limits are. 
you're not kind of imposed upon in terms of race, I suppose. Um, you can try a little bit around an area, particularly if you're moving to a new area and you're not quite sure what type of practice you want to work in and what type of area you want to work in. You can try a few sessions here and there, and that's certainly a huge benefit that people think about when they first come out of training. And it could be good in terms of income if you do the number of sessions and you get the right roles. And it could be quite lucrative in terms of earning, in terms of this versus salary general practice. And we'll talk about this a little bit later on. Some of the pros, though, employment rights are certainly things that you lose when you become a locum GP. And that's something that I hadn't really thought about. Pooja, I don't know whether you'd um, thought much about that yourself. Well, yeah, as I said, the cons of locuming are that you have no employment rights. And that was certainly one of my concerns, as I mentioned, about not knowing what I would have to do if I had to call in sick for a shift. Um, and then, as I, as I mentioned, may not get regular work. I had to let go of work. Uh, because it didn't suit my hours and if you're not getting regular work it can affect your ability to get regular income and that's important because often when we CCT it's at key stages in our lives certainly for us we were about to buy a new house and so we were going out looking for a mortgage, uh, I'm sure many of you may be in that situation and you have to think about it and I'm sure Tommy uh, will touch upon that later on and, uh, you know, it can be quite an isolating career if you're not someone who tries to mingle in with the practices that you work in. It can become quite lonely uh, if you don't have a good network around you. So say there's some things that we picked up and thought about in terms of what we could have done better or, or been useful for us to know and think about before we started locum general practice. So terms and conditions is a big one. And, and I didn't really realize how important terms and conditions is. And I guess no one really does until you need terms and conditions and then you turn around it's kind of one word against another um so setting terms and conditions is really really important yeah that's really important and if most of you don't know where to start the bma have released a draft template feel free to alter that according to your requirements and it's something that practices are aware of as well but it gives you a good starting point so for uh, myself, I decided to offer terms and conditions where if I'm not feeling well, I may offer to find another locum or I offer to work the next shift for free. So terms and conditions are really what you want to set them down as and it's a matter of negotiating. And making sure, I guess, that the other side knows and also agrees to those terms and conditions because one thing, having them and sending them to a practice, but if they haven't sent you something in writing to say, yes, we agree with this, then it doesn't really stand um, once issues come up. Confirming just in writing, very, very important. How often I remember just getting called from a practice saying, can you do next Friday? And I just verbally said, yeah, of course, I'll, I'll, I'll see you at three o'clock. Um, but thinking about now and certainly hearing stories of people who have turned up to shift and they're double booked. They're, they're, they've booked two, you know, through no fault of somebody's, there's just, uh, just a miscommunication. There's, there's two people in book for the same shift. So one person is turned away and that leaves you without work for that afternoon. And and it can sour the relationship a little bit. So confirm shifts in writing, make sure even if it's done verbally, send an email, get them to confirm it back so you know you've got something written down in case that kind of thing happens. And also keeping diary of shifts on your own side because it's so easy again when you're getting, particularly when you've got relationships with multiple practices and they're calling you and saying, can you do this shift and that shift? It's so easy to double book. And then of course the onus is on you um, and how do you deal with these things? And if you haven't planned things and started writing them down, it can get quite difficult in terms of managing a busy schedule if you're working uh, Monday to Friday. Uh, and the most important thing that I found was actually when I turned up to some practices, they had generic login details and I was asked to sign in as Dr. Locum, which at the time sounded all fine and you just get on with it as a newly qualified GP. But actually what you've got to think of is a clinical governance issue. If a complaint comes in five years later down the line, and you're signed in as Dr. Locum and all the other locums that have worked there before and after you, how do you uh, say that you've worked that shift for definite? How do you make sure that nobody's altered the consultation details because everyone's got access to the login details? So something to think about, asking for your own login details is something that I would really recommend to protect yourself and to also protect the practice. Uh, really important. I, I certainly worked many shifts as Dr. Locum and looking back at it now, it's just something that, you know, now 
understanding that the pros and cons of that I'd never think about doing but it's just something that no one really explained to us and you just trying to turn up and that's just the way it's always been done so you get on with it sometimes um, a system to, to to keep on track of invoices and payments again there are people who do multiple 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 shifts and they know themselves that they're not claiming for every shift they do because they're just getting overwhelmed by the numbers and dates and the the amounts and all the forms that need to be filled in so again having a system in place of course there are online systems available for this now but making sure that something is there that works for you or you know you're really good and you're, you're confident in terms of chasing up invoices and making sure they get paid because again it's one thing you know, I was guilty of this. I just send an invoice and just expect that it'll get paid. But checking back, making sure these things happen, um, very, very important when you work as a locum GP. Higher rates, um, yes, look lucrative. And sometimes you look at a, a, a practice and you look at a three-hour shift and it's a really good rate. And you think, wow, that's that's me. And you take it. But, you know, you've got to bear in mind there's it's probably higher for a reason. And um, bearing that in mind, yes, you might you might take a higher rate, but you might be taking on a lot more. And the stress levels that come with that might be um, important to think about as well. Um, and how do you want to work? Like, you know, it's one thing to say I want to do Monday to Friday, but but is it better to do a few longer days and taking a few days off, or do you prefer to do a few shorter days but do more regular work? And again, this is completely up to you. But if you haven't planned it or thought about it, you might end up taking a few months to actually think about what's right for you. And having a bit of a think about that beforehand uh, would be beneficial for sure. And. More importantly, how do you decide what rate works for you? That's a key question as a locum GP. Often we don't know what a normal rate is for a session. It's important to speak to your colleagues around you to get an idea of what sort of rates are going in your area. And uh, an issue that often crops up is whether pension is included in that rate. So when I first started out, I would see shifts advertised at X, X number per hour, and I would. I wouldn't think about my pension, whether that was included or not, but it's important to ask that question because actually uh, some practices may say that pension is included in the rate and you need to be aware of that when it comes to filling out your pension forms. And once again, that's something that I'm sure Tommy will touch upon. And more importantly, uh, on the topic of finance, make sure that you're keeping aside enough for your tax bill. It wasn't something that I had considered when I first started out. And when you come out of training and you start earning as a locum GP, suddenly it can seem like a huge uplift from your trainee years. And you've just got to bear in mind that when you're a trainee, your tax already comes off your final income. And you need to think about that when, it, when you're a qualified GP about putting some money aside for your tax. So yeah, I'm sure Tommy will have some stuff to say about this kind of stuff going forward. But Tommy, did you ever locum yourself, or were you, you say you mentioned you're a partner? Were you straight into partnership? No. So I, uh, out of CCT, I did a salary job for three months. Realised that 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 was an error, and then I locumed for about two years, uh, over two years actually, and I loved it. Um, I found it really, you know, really great to just visit all these different practices and work out which ones were good and which ones were not good. And you know, some of the tips, all of those tips that you've just been through, uh, they are absolutely key. Um, the one thing I would say is that it's not a binary choice. You could, if you wanted, do a little bit of salary, maybe like a day, a week or two, and then pick up some locum shifts as well, because it can seem really daunting to just jump straight into locum. But no, I locum for over two years, and it was invaluable for me just to see other practices around. And then that was how I ended up getting my partnership, because uh, I was locuming there, and they obviously liked what they saw, and that was that. that. So big fan of locuming, actually. Fantastic. And it's certainly something that people will try. And it's important to, to think about trying it. But you'll know within probably a couple of weeks, whether it's something that you think you can do for a number of years, or whether it's something that you um, is not quite for you. And some of these things can, can hopefully give you a bit of a heads up about those types of thoughts. Yeah, I mean, definitely. And all of those tips are absolutely vital. So um, obviously, you've told us a bit about your both of your career paths already, but it would definitely be good to know more uh, about your portfolio careers and any tips that you have for developing them. So portfolio careers, I guess, is the, the, the buzz term at the moment. And, and trainees who are coming to the end. We hope a lot of trainees get through their exams and training. But when they're coming to the end, they, they often ask about portfolio careers. and How do I become a a portfolio GP and I guess essentially portfolio GP, GP just means not doing one thing even, I suppose when you're doing salaried and locum roles yourself 
Tommy, you're a bit of a portfolio GP, you're doing a bit of one role versus a bit of another. And it could be two or three different clinical roles. It could be a clinical role plus something completely different. So I guess it's developing interest alongside your core day-to-day -day general practice clinical work. It's not for everybody. There are pros and cons of portfolio general practice. And some people are quite happy to go and, and be a salary GP and do five days a week. And, and, and that's their prime and only role. And that's fine. And there's nothing wrong in that, but it just seems to be the buzz term. But it's important to remember that it is definitely not for everybody. And, and you don't want to fall into the trap of thinking that I need to have something on the side. I can't just do normal day-to-day -day general practice because it's certainly not the case. Yeah, and portfolio working is a buzzword that you hear a lot as a trainee, and a lot of people think portfolio working is uh, some uh, is the best way to work as a GP. But you've got to remember, it's not for everyone. Actually, mm -hmm. quite a few of my friends enjoy not being a portfolio GP and just having one role, either as a salary GP or as a locum GP or even as a GP partner, and are happy just doing that and uh, moving forward. So you've got to bear in mind that although there, there is a lot of buzz around portfolio working, it may not actually be something that you need to do yourself. And there's another buzz that's around at the moment in terms of burnout and stress and trying to figure out ways to reduce this happening. And for some people being a portfolio GP really helps with that, having something different every day, not being too tied down with one thing, being able to, to flexibly move between one job and another. Whereas for some people, it really adds to, to burnout and stress. So if you're someone who, is doing something for the wrong reason or you're jumping into something additional because you think that's the best thing to do, actually it could add to your stress. So it's really important to try and work out whether this is actually for you or not and, and not kind of pick up something just because maybe other people are doing it or suggesting that it's a good thing to do. So you've got to ensure that's something that you enjoy. But we certainly found things that we enjoyed outside of uh, clinical general practice and Pooja, as she mentioned, did a lot of leadership in medical politics. Yeah, so as I said, um, there's a lot of buzz around portfolio working, and I certainly had no idea about what I actually wanted to do. And getting into portfolio working, especially medico politics, which I later found out is something that I have a passion for, just happened by accident. I was a trainee, I, I was in a really tough placement, and I really wanted to learn more about my terms and conditions. And so like most people, I, I turned on to the BMA website, and whilst I was reading through my terms and conditions, I came across the GP trainee subcommittee for the BMA. And I noticed that there were elections going on. And I don't know what happened to me, but at, at that particular moment in time, I, I just decided to apply for the role, not really thinking too much about it. And uh, to cut a long story short, I got onto the trainee subcommittee and it just opened my eyes to medico politics and what impact it has on our working lives. And as I moved throughout my medico political career, I became more aware of different organizations and their roles and I started applying every time I thought I could bring about a change or it was something that I was interested in I went for it I didn't think about whether I had the experience to do so I didn't think whether I had the right credentials I just had a passion for it and I knew what change I wanted to bring about and before I knew it I was vice chair of the LMC I was the youngest ever um, Chair, vice chair and the first female to reach the executive position in the LMC as uh, as an ethnic minority. So it just shows that you don't need a plan to become a portfolio GP. Uh, you've just got to have a passion. And I think that that's kind of similar for myself, really. I didn't plan to go into medical education. That is now my career. So I'm fully into medical education full time now. But when I first started and I first finished as a trainee, I wanted to be a GP trainer. That was my initial aim. And I therefore started to do a little bit of teaching on the side, thinking, well, what, what will be good for my CV for me to be able to become a GP trainer? So we started running some courses. And then from there, I started to look at other medical education roles and how I can get into the deanery. And I just started applying and volunteering for things and um, knocking on doors and, and asking people about availabilities. And I remember going to see um, our local area director and, and I didn't think anything would come of it, but she mentioned there was a, a locum PD role going. So I just applied for it and it was a good you know, hour and a half drive away. And, and I thought, well, it's, it's, is, it, is it too much of a drive? Shall I wait for the next opportunity? But I grabbed it and then I was there for a few months and that opened up more doors and you know, more committees were opened up and it, and it enabled me to, to gain 
confidence in education and, and then gain a bit of experience in education. And then I became an examiner and appraiser. And I started to do lots and lots of different things. And eventually came full circle where um, I went full time into uh, rural medical education. That's how I know a lot of you guys on the webinar right now. But so my portfolio career started off with um, a bit of an idea of, OK, I like teaching and I want to become a trainer one day. That was my aim of being a portfolio GP. Um, and it kind of just shows that as you jump into these things, you don't know where they're going to lead and opportunities open up. Um, and certainly um, our two journeys are very different, but it just shows that the variety of what you can be in terms of a portfolio GP. And, and Tommy, I guess, coming back to you, you mentioned that you've done salaried work, you've done locum work. You're obviously a partner now and you now co-run Medics Money. So I guess that makes you a bit of a portfolio GP as well. Uh, yeah, I would describe myself as a portfolio partner because I also um, do GP with special interest in dermatology or GIPers as a GP with extended roles, they call it. So, yeah, I also do dermatology. So I think, yeah, I've got a GP portfolio career, which um, it's hard to uh, wangle. But uh, if you can, it's great. So, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, it's it's really interesting listening to everybody's story and your guys story is is amazing. Um, but the great thing about being a GP is there's so much choice. And I think, as you said, just follow what you enjoy. Don't do something because you feel everyone else is doing it. If you enjoy locuming, do locuming. If you love being a salaried, do salaried. Uh, when I became a partner a few years ago, no one wanted to do a partnership. But I just looked at the opportunity and I enjoyed it. So I went for it. So I think just trust your instincts and don't follow the herd. Yeah, absolutely. Agreed. Um, Let's kind of move on to the next one, I guess. Yeah, uh, I'm not being antisocial in the chat. I can't see the chat and Pooja's uh, doing her best to uh, remedy that at the moment, but I'm not being antisocial. So, um, well, I guess, yeah, it does move on perfectly to the next one um, about thinking outside the box. So I would definitely be interested to see what, uh, you know, your advice is to the, the, the GPs that are graduating shortly. Well, one thing I've certainly see these days is, is the types of questions that I'm getting from trainees who are finishing uh, GP training is very different to the kind of questions I was getting from GP trainees who were finishing maybe five years ago. Five years ago, I was getting one standard question, what should I be, partner, locum, or salary GP? That that was the, the question that I was getting time and time again. Now the questions I'm getting are, are, are so much broader. You know, how do I get into this type of general practice? How, who do I contact to get into this kind of, this kind of field? And it's just so amazing to see how many different ideas GPs have. And what lends itself to that is the ability to act on those ideas. And I think there are not really any limits in terms of what you want to do in terms of your career. And for those guys who are coming to the end of their career in a couple of weeks time or to the beginning of their career in a couple of weeks time, just going into it with, with an open mind and, and thinking that there are gonna be opportunities there if I look for them and say yes to things. And yes, you have the standard choices that, that people are going to be making as always. Should I be a partner, salaried, locum, mix of both, try bits of obviously other digital general practice, of course, is going to be getting bigger and bigger with the developments that would happen in the next couple of months. Do you want to be an out of hours GP where you solely work weekends, nights? Again, that's a choice that some people make. And of course, a gypsy like yourself, Tommy, going into dermatology and doing other bits of clinical work alongside clinical general practice. So those are the kind of standard thinking thoughts and questions that people used to have and, and will continue to have. But now there are so many other things that people are starting to open their eyes to. GP retainer scheme, GP fellowships, um, things that Pooja can come on to in a bit if people need to know a bit more about those. But those certainly went around four or five years ago. People are working block work versus part-time. So part-time, yes, you know, work three or four days a week. But now people work in block work just only every Tuesday afternoon and every Wednesday morning. And that's their fixed sessions and you can work like that now obviously it's a bit easier now than I think it was uh, maybe going back five ten years ago and of course all the additional things that you can think about doing now and with social media and being able to contact people directly and you know getting uh, messages into people's inboxes that you know just just without even knowing them the, the opportunities that are there thinking outside the box is certainly something that um, I think is there for the taking right now in terms of opportunity. And so the the natural question is, how do I find out about these opportunities? Because certainly when I qualified, I didn't know where to look in order to find a job or find out about all these different roles. In fact, I came across all these different roles when I entered the medico-political arena. So my top tip would be actually that you look at your CCG website, so you look at your uh, deanery websites, and they tend to be the best places where they're advertising these new workforce initiatives there's 
a workforce crisis. So there's all sorts of schemes. And fortunately for you guys, a lot of them are targeted at newly qualified GPs. That's what GP fellowships are about. It's a great opportunity to develop a new skill, a new interest, whilst someone else is paying for it. You may have heard of the new partnership scheme, but it's always important to think about how this affects you and how it works for you. So even being a digital doctor, working for these online platforms, how will they protect you if a complaint comes through? How do they support you? How do they look after you? You've got to be thinking about these sort of things. So of course, there are no limits. And that's the great thing about being a GP. You can choose what you want to do, find a passion, and chances are you'll, you'll be able to fit that alongside or even within your clinical portfolio. But please, please, please do look at the um, small print and think about how this works for you. And also, wherever you end up working, whether it's purely in general practice work or whether you end up working at a CCG role, always think about what, what things can I do to add value to the organization that I'm in? Is there any problems that I can go in um, and solve? Maybe things have been done for a certain way for many, many years, but you've come in, you've shown initiative, and you can go in and bring some energy to bring about change. Is there something that can be done quicker? Because things are done in a certain way. It may be they're done right, but could you go in and offer any advice given the experience that you might have got from another practice and take it into a different practice, for example. So there are always opportunities to look for and asking these kind of questions whenever you go into a new role are useful. And if you're going for interviews for things, then thinking along these kind of lines in terms of what can I bring value to you for when it comes to an organization? Because remember, everybody's going to have the same CV, everyone's going to have done the same MRCGP. It's how can you show that you're going to be bringing something to that organization and why should they be bringing you on board? Whether it's a clinical organization like a practice or whether it's a completely different role that has nothing to do with clinical general practice work. One of the questions we often get asked as well is extra qualifications. Should I be doing other things now that I've come out of GP training? And of course, you don't have to do anything now. You've got MRCGP. It's a huge um, positive in itself. And a lot of people are happy to leave it at that. But some people want to go and do additional things. But one thing I would say is that if you're thinking about doing additional uh, qualifications, make sure you do it for a couple of key reasons. And we talk about the two Ps that you need to have in your mind. Because I see a lot of people starting things like diplomas and MSCs, and then they kind of get halfway through and then they just kind of fizzle out and stop. And then they think, oh, I've wasted that time, wasted that money, wasted that effort. Think about passion or plan. At least have one of these, but preferably both. So do you have a passion for something? So if you have a passion for, and you've always had a passion for ENT, for example, or you've always had a passion for minor surgery, then yes, that's a huge plus because when you start doing these diplomas and extra qualifications amongst remember trying to be a new gp and trying to figure out lots of things that you probably didn't think about before the passion is going to drive you through having that passion is going to make you do the extra work do the extra reading go do the extra modules do the extra write-ups if you don't have passion then it's going to fizzle out or at least have a plan so you may not have a passion for something like dermatology or a passion for something like women's health but say, for example, you have a plan that, look, I'm going to get this diploma and then I'm going to go into a practice and offer myself in terms of being a lead in one of these areas or developing a service in a particular practice. At least if you have a plan, again, when it gets tough and you kind of feel like, oh, do I really want to write this up tonight or not? That plan is going to drive you through. So ideally have both a passion or a plan for something, but at least have one of them. If you can't find a way to have any of these two P's, then maybe jumping into an extra qualification is not for you because lots of other things are going to get in the way and probably going to um, take you away from finishing that diploma off. And also thinking about, is there a market inverted commas? So is there a need for me to go into something like, for example, is it worth doing a diploma that everybody is doing now? Because is it going to be increased competition to try and get something out of it at the other end? Or is there something that's growing exponentially in terms of need? And therefore, when you jump into some of these extra things, you're going to be able to add value at the other side. So thinking about these things are really important. Some of the common diplomas um, that we often see and hear about are here. There are others as well. But again, please think twice before you do it. Make sure you've got a passion or make sure you've got a plan. Tommy, you said you got a gypsy in, in dermatology. What was that journey like and how did it, how did it look? Um, I'm glad you mentioned passion, basically, because uh, I think that's really important. So <laughs> the reason I got into dermatology was really random. I've got the most atopic family and my wife has really bad hand eczema. So I was doing GP training and she was like, look, I go to my GP and they don't sort out my hands. I was like, oh, yeah, they're not very good, are they? And I was like, hang on, I don't know anything about derm either. So I just went along to the local derm service to learn some dermatology because I was so bad at it, you know, really bad. 
Uh, and then I realized that I liked it. And also I realized that a lot of other GPs uh, weren't that great at it either. So I thought actually for, for the patients, this is really good if I could get better at derm. And then, you know, somebody said, oh, what about being a derm gypsy? And, and I never, it never crossed my mind. And I thought, oh, okay, I'll do it. And I looked at the diploma and it was expensive. It was about six grand. Uh, and it was a lot of work, you know, uh, but uh, I did it. And for me, it was a really great decision. I loved it. Uh, I still love it now. I do a day a week of it now. Um, and um, it's brilliant. Uh, so like, I got into it for a really random reason, which was wow. because I was so bad at dermatology and I couldn't <laughs> fix my wife's hands. So I think, you know, just um, I, I just think just think outside the box. Don't follow the herd. Get something. If you, something strikes you as a passion and, and you think there's a need for it, just do it. And and what have you done? And with that dermatology diploma, have you what have you done in terms of your practice? Do you do an extra day of dermatology? Is that just for your practice, or is that bringing in patients from other practices as well? How have you developed that? Yeah, good question. So um, I work for the community dermatology service, so it's separate from my practice. And so I have a whole day where I just have referrals from other GPs, um, and I see them, and I do minor surgery as well, so I remove BCCs, um, and that's something that I've really enjoyed developing. Uh, and again, if you're sitting there thinking, wow, that sounds really impressive, I had no minor surgery experience whatsoever, okay? So if you do it, you you can do this. You definitely can if you're passionate about it. But yeah, that's how I developed that. Uh, and I think it's dermatology is so rewarding because uh, I don't know what the wait like, times are like where you are, but the waiting times near us, you know, are, are not great. So if I see someone in GP clinic with really bad eczema, there's a chance that if they see me, I might be able to sort it out. And that's really rewarding. I think, you know, going forward, uh, you'll see more of uh, of us sort of not specializing, but having extra skills. So one of my partners is really expert at women's health. So, you know, I ask her women's health questions and she asks me dermatology questions. It's a great arrangement because then the patient gets the best result and I learn a bit of women's health. She learns a bit of dermatology. So I think having that expertise, I found really valuable. So I think your advice is really good that you need to have a passion or a plan or both. And if, if you've got that, just do it. Great. I think that's, that's really useful to get that insight, actually, because a lot of people do talk about gypsies and how do I become them and and yeah having that having that story behind you is, is is really useful and I think outside the box thinking is great and a lot of people are looking to think how can I think outside the box but you don't have to but if you want to do it then make sure you've got this passion or this plan uh, and as you can hear from all of our experiences it's okay if you don't have a plan yet because uh, as you've heard with Tommy and certainly with myself we had no plan and we just happened to have a passion for something and went for it Definitely. Um, and I still can't see the questions, but if anyone has any questions about how to become a derm gypsy or anything like that, I would be um, happy to take those because um, it's something that I really believe is, you know, it keeps me from burning out because I love it. Um, it's really interesting. It's variety. Um, and it's just one of my portfolio roles. So I love it. But we better move on um, to talk about probably my least favorite subject, um, but something that is incredibly important. And something that I definitely neglected uh, because I'd had enough of filling in all the reflections when I was a trainee. Um, but uh, appraisal, super important. Uh, give us the your quick tips for what we need to know. Uh, appraisal, a lot of people pull fear them. I'll come on to appraisal in a second, but very quickly, sorry, Tommy, once again, you can't get the, the, the chat on your side. There are questions coming in, and we promise we will be going back to them at the end. So we're not ignoring these questions that are coming. I promise we'll be going through each and every one of them at the end. So thank you for sending them in, and please do keep sending them in as well. So appraisals, and yes, don't you know, don't fear them first and foremost. I have seen appraisals from both angles. I was an appraisee, of course, um, and had my own appraisals done, but then I became an appraiser about three years, I think, into being a, a GP myself. So I've seen them from both sides. And the first thing I say is please don't fear them. Um, they're not like your kind of ESR or your end of year report that your supervisor has to do. It's not like an ARCP where you pass or fail. It's supposed to be something that um, you use as your own development to peer-to-peer -peer discussion, and it's not kind of a pass or fail. So don't fear them. You need to plan for them, yes. You need to put a little bit of time aside, yes. Um, don't leave the last minute for sure. And, and often when I was appraising people, it was amazing how many times I was chasing people to literally a day before their appraisal to send me something so I can have a look at it beforehand. And again, it doesn't set a good impression off and it just puts you in a lot of stress. So don't leave it to the last minute, plan them well, don't fear them and don't see them as a powerful fail. It's not about um, am I good enough to continue? It's just am I showing that I'm a bit able to carry on doing the role and developing as I should be. So 
for those of you who haven't had an appraisal or don't know much about the appraisal process, some of you guys on the webinar, apologies, you all have already had that, I'm sure. But it's an annual meeting between a doctor and their appraiser. And it's a review of all of the roles that you need to be a doctor for. So Tommy's talked about being a GP partner, for example. He's talked about being a, a gypsy and he's got a few other roles as well. So he'd be appraised for all of those individual roles. When I was being a, a clinical GP, a, a PD, a appraiser, all these things I would have to be appraised for every year to show that I'm keeping up to date and I'm able to continue doing the role with all the necessary CPD um, that I needed to do so. So it could be um, you're just being appraised initially in your first year anyway, just as being a clinical GP, and, and that's enough in terms of getting evidence for. But as you develop your careers, you start to do some out-of-hours work, you need to show separate um, CPD and separate evidence for you being unable to continue working as an out-of-hours doctor. If you're a gypsy, for example, if you're a trainer and you go into any kind of education, if you go into any kind of major medical political roles, all of these areas are what you will be appraised on in your annual appraisal under that one umbrella. So a lot of these acronyms you'll remember, obviously, from, from training days. So this doesn't stop, unfortunately, when you come out, as Tommy mentioned, and you be a GP, you still got to do your PSQs and your MSFs, and you still got to write up your SEAs, of course, and your complaints, and you still got to do your audits, for example. CPD, obviously, you've got to be demonstrating now that throughout all of your roles, you're keeping up to date. So that could be clinical CPD. It could be CPD to do with education and other things that you might be doing. Typically, 50 points in a year is what's looked at, so 50 hours equivalent of work. That could be um, e-modules, meetings, but also things that you do in terms of projects and things. There's lots of things that you can put into that CBD quota. You see your appraiser usually three times before you move on. Sometimes it's it's less than that, but generally you see them three years in a row. That's the maximum that you can have with a single appraiser. You can defer it if you're taking breaks in your career, for example, and when you get to your appraisal, you write up your portfolio, you submit it, usually a couple of weeks ideally before your appraisal date, and you are not assessed, but four areas are looked at in terms of the evidence that you're giving, knowledge, skills, and performance, contributing and complying with systems to protect patients, communication, partnership, and teamwork, and maintaining trust. And your appraiser, once you've had your appraisal meeting, will write up a synopsis, if you like, taking into account these four areas and looking at the evidence that you've put in front of them to show that you're keeping up to date. So your designated body, so use your NHS area team, will allocate you an appraiser. You can't choose an appraiser. It's going to be someone who's allocated to you, and you'll probably hear, be hearing from them actually a very time. Some people hear from them very early um, after qualifying. Some people hear from them a week or two before their actual first appraisal. You then book your appraisal. It's your responsibility to do this. Um, a lot of appraisers will contact you and say, look, you're, you're my appraisal. When do you want to do this? But um, it's your responsibility to do it. If they don't, you then do your preparation. You submit, like we said, they advise 14 days before you submit your portfolio to your appraiser. Then you have your appraisal meeting. It could be at your place of work, their place at work, a, a place of mutual agreement. Um, it's not a pass or fail like we talked about. It's, it's a personal development um, tool and it should be a supportive environment. Of course, if there are issues that are flagged, then things get taken further. But most appraisals, certainly every appraisal that I did, um, and I must have done probably 100, 150 appraisals, were all fine. They're all actually quite nice to, to see what other GPs do, and it's quite useful to, to ask questions to your appraiser because they will have seen lots of other GPs doing lots of other um, things and, and interesting things and getting some advice from them is really, really important. So don't just see it as a one-way street. Go in there and, and use their experience and knowledge uh, and try and make it something that you get something out of as well. After your appraisal, like we said, you should get a, a summary of the discussion for you to read through and review and um, and query. Once you're both happy that the appraisal write-up is as, as agreed, then it's submitted to the responsible officer who will then keep it in their records. And then there'll be a bit of feedback that you should be doing afterwards as well, which really helps the appraiser on their side. And then you'll be seeing them again um, in the next year if it's not your third one um, already. Things to consider, so like we said, when you think about CPD, yes, it's 50 points, minimum 50 points, but you want to be thinking about all the different areas that you do. So if you are going to do some out of hours work in your first year after CCT, make sure you're building up some evidence. For example, if you're doing a PSQ and an MSF, and remember you have to do one PSQ and one MSF every revalidation cycle. So in a revalidation cycle, that's made up of five individual appraisal. So throughout that cycle, you need to do one PSQ and one MSF. So we talked about doing it in the 
third, fourth, or fifth year rather than doing it in your first year of your cycle because then when it gets close to revalidation, then maybe we'll say, well, it's been a while, let's just do another one. So it's best to maybe do these a little bit later on. But if you're doing a PSQ in MSF, then this has to represent your whole scope of practice. So for example, when I was um, doing my appraisals towards the end, I was, and I was doing my multi-source feedback, I was sending questionnaires to my clinical um, Work, workmates and my team are sending to, to my educational work and also other fellow appraisers as well. So you're supposed to be doing it across the scope of practice. Quality improvement activities, so audits by far are still the commonest thing that people do to, to show quality improvement, but you can write up case reviews. There are lots of other things that you can do. Uh, and we're going to all this in more detail in our online course in terms of the options that you can think about when it comes to appraisal. SEAs, complaints, PDPs continue, of course, and these are things that um, you will be discussing with your appraiser and thinking, how can I push my career in the direction I want and using them for a bit of advice might be useful. And you still have to do your reflection. That doesn't end, of course, um, when you finish being a trainee, but it's it's a lot less, I'd say, heavy in terms of what the requirements are going forward. And appraisal can be quite a burdensome process if you're not smart with how to tackle it so some of the things I found useful especially with a little one at home it's always hard to get that dedicated time to sort out your appraisal is being smart with your CPD so maybe you're a salary GP and you've got uh, your CPD time which you sh should have in your BMA model contract if it, you are in a GMS practice but you know, practice meetings count as CPD. You can reflect on what you've learned in your practice meetings. Maybe you've decided to go with an appraisal toolkit that has an app on your phone. So whenever you attend CPD events, you can make notes on the app and you can upload it directly. Maybe type it into notes on your phone and then upload it from there. Maybe do the RCGP e-learning and uh, which gets automatically uploaded to some appraisal toolkits. So it's just about being smart with how to tackle your appraisal and make sure that you include your compliments as well. So one of the things I didn't realize is that when I used to organize events or do something well, I used to get emails saying, thank you, I learned this or you know, this was great feedback that we received about you. You know, keep those emails and add that to your portfolio. Maybe you're part of WhatsApp groups, Facebook groups, anything that you use to learn from or affects your clinical practice. They, these are all things that you can include in your appraisal. Tommy, how are you finding the appraisal process? Have you ever thought about being an appraiser yourself? Um, I got to know my limits with, uh, you know, roles. So partner, GP Derm, founder, medics, money, dad, um, and husband. Uh, so no, I haven't. But I think um, just get efficient at it. You know, as Pooja just said, you know, there's so much that we do. Uh, you know, you easily do 50 uh, hours a year, easy. Uh, but you just got to log it. So just get efficient at logging it. Um, and I think one thing for me is I started seeing appraisal as a bit of a burden, as Pooja said, but. Actually, my appraiser was a really, really experienced GP partner. So when I was sort of locuming, thinking about becoming a partnership, I said, you know, sort of got the, his words of wisdom on it. Um, and that was really, really useful. You know, some of these appraisers are really experienced GPs and you can, you know, harness that experience. And he gave me some great advice, basically. So um, it is a bit burdensome. Just make it as super easy as you can. And your appraiser is a really useful source of advice. Brilliant. So I think that's the first four questions come from your side, guys. Just guys, give us some feedback. What are you thinking? Is it helping so far? Is it useful? Is it hitting the level that you think you need to know? Give us some feedback so we can tailor it for the second half. Good, excellent. Some really nice words coming through. Very useful. Lots of good things. Lots of good tips. Helpful. Good. Excellent. I'm glad. So we're going to go into a little, a couple of minutes break while we get some water, and hope you guys are going to have a bit of a break yourself as well. But as promised, we're going to give you the code now, or the first 10 codes for our post-CCT GP Max course. So these are all the kind of things that we cover in detail. It's a half-day course. It's something that you can look at for one, three, six, or 12 months. And we've got a 20% discount for you guys on the webinar only that will last until midnight or until the 10 codes run out. So CCT save 20 is the code that you can use on the website. I'll quickly show you where you find it on the website because people often struggle. If you go to our website up here, you look at online courses and you move down to the post CCT Max online course, and then you can plug in that code 
and get 20% off. But that's only until midnight tonight, and it's only for the first 10 uses of the code. And the second thing that we promise you is a 10% discount on our flash revision cards. As you can see, we've covered all the kind of core NICKS guidelines just to keep up to date for GPs, but also for trainees preparing for their exams as well. So um, there's a 10% discount again for the first 10 uses only. The code is card save 10. There's 150 cards like we talked about. These are all the things that we cover for really quick glance use for in the middle of clinics or also preparing for exams. How do you find that on the website? You jump back in and you go to products um, at the top here and you'll see the Canvas uh, Will Pass cards up here. So you can use that code to grab those. Again, 10 only. I'll leave these codes on for two minutes. Please do get a drink and we'll be back in a couple of minutes and we'll re-go with the other four questions that we're gonna be asking Tommy in terms of finance. So you don't wanna miss that. Okay, guys, welcome back. Hopefully you had a bit of a quick break and we're ready to go for the second session. People are asking how many codes are left. So we've got five codes left for the online course. Five have been used. And for the cards, we've got four left. Six codes have gone for the cards. So if you're going to get them, then I'd jump on now before they run out. Because remember, there are 10 each of these two. So we're going to move into the next session now. And the next session is us quizzing Tommy, really, because we're going to get his valuable advice in terms of financial matters. So the first question we have of Tommy, and hope, Tommy, are you back? Are you there? I'm here, but I still Excellent. can't see the chat, but we're going to deal with that some some way. So, But I can hear you yes. loud and clear. promise we'll go through all, all the questions and anything. Actually, Tommy, a lot of questions have come for you. So we'll make sure we go through these with you and grab your answers at the end. But Tommy, what are the commonest questions that you get from GP trainees or new GPs about finance as a whole? We'll touch on some of these in detail, but what are the commonest things that you get asked um, being involved with Medics Money? Yeah, um, there is so much to know about finances, and I imagine that you haven't been taught a great deal uh, during your GP training or during any other training or even during medical school. Um, and what you have been taught has probably come in the form of salesmen trying to sell you a product, which you're not quite sure what it is or even what it does and if you even need that insurance. Um, so the reason we started Medics Money is because we were really frustrated that there was no good independent source of financial information for doctors. And obviously with Ed's unique skills as a chartered accountant and a chartered tax advisor, and a GP now, um, you know, we had this unique skill set. So I think, you know, one of your slides earlier was just, is there a problem? Do you have a solution? And are you passionate about it? And we realized that we were, so that was why we started Medics Money. So the commonest thing, you know, that uh, my, uh, the ST3 at my practice will, uh, he came up to me the other day and said, I need you to sort out my finances. I was like, okay, well, what do you actually mean? He was like, I don't know. Like, I know that you do something about tax and other stuff. So sort out my finances. So <laughs> that's a massive question. And I think, you know, we're not going to cover everything tonight, but what we are going to cover tonight is the big wins. So as a GP SD3 about to become a GP, uh, this is what, you know, you need to start thinking about. The first one, I've put on the slide is tax, uh, avoiding making charitable donations to HMRC. It's so easy to overpay tax as a doctor and hopefully you're all aware that you can claim a tax rebate um, of up to 40% of the cost of your AKT, your CSA, um, your Royal College fees and loads of other things. Okay, so the average GP trainee who uses our forms and they're totally free to download and the link is up there, will save £2,345. Uh, so it is so worth claiming your tax rebates. And I understand, you know, you've been, it's been so hectic training. You've just done your AKT and your CSA or, or whatever. You haven't had time, but you've got to make time because there is a lot of money left on the table. And if you don't claim it, uh, the time will elapse. You only have four years to claim it. So just don't hang around. It's a lot of money, £2,345. And there's loads of misinformation about what you can claim and what you can't claim. So that was why Ed wrote the guides. Um, they are they tell you everything that you need. You can claim online. You don't have to phone Inland Revenue. Uh, you, we tell you how to get receipts. Uh, they're step by step. Uh, and last count, I think over 18,000 doctors have downloaded these. And that's just from word of mouth and things like this. People, doctors telling each other, oh, these guides are really good. So definitely check out the free guide to claim your tax rebates. Uh, and, and you know, the end of training, the start of your, your new career, 
is a great point to do that. Another thing which I think I did just touch on now is protection. You know, you've worked super hard to be a, to qualify as a GP. You know, your future earning potential as a GP is an asset that you must think about protecting. Um, so I'm not really into insurance. I don't have phone insurance. I don't have laptop insurance. When I buy a washing machine and they say, do you want to add insurance for only £1.59 a month? I definitely don't do it. I don't need it. But if you cannot afford to replace your income uh, if you were to get ill or you know if the worst was to happen you were to die then you really need to think about getting some protection so i've talked about income protection which replaces your income if you get ill critical illness if you get a critical illness it pays out and then life insurance self-explanatory if you die so i don't insure anything that i don't need to insure i don't even insure my beloved bikes or my surfboards but I do ensure my income because without my income, my family would you know, not be able to survive financially. So you need to think about that. Then, you know, if we're thinking about, okay, so I need to get some protection, where can I get it? Um, with financial advisors, they sell protection. So you need to get a good independent financial advisor that understands doctors, okay? Because if you just go on online and search for income protection, they're gonna be advising non-doctors and all of our terms and conditions are different our sick pay is different there are features specific to doctors that you need to you need to get advice on so that is why on medics money we only recommend independent financial advisors that um, specialize in doctors and every single one has been verified by us and has reviews from doctors like you so we'll get into that later but I, I got to stress that that I don't insure anything that I don't you know that I don't need to insure, but I cannot survive without my income. And if I get ill, my family will not be able to survive. So for that reason, I chose to take out income protection. And on our blog, we've got a bit of a story about basically I definitely left it too late because I didn't know where to buy it, and I was suspicious of people trying to sell me stuff, and so that resulted in me not buying it. If you go to Medics Money, you can find an independent financial advisor that will help you out and make help you make the right decisions. Um, so that's number two. Number three is only one one line, a financial PDP. Um, so we talked a bit about having a PDP, a personal development plan for your career you know, during appraisal. Uh, and obviously that's really important, but you also need a financial personal development plan. So if that's the first time you've ever heard of it, um, you know, this is, you're, you're in the right place because it's extremely important. And what it is, it just like your career PDP, it's a plan of what you're gonna do with your finances. Um, so I like to break them down, the goals in my financial PDP into sort of short-term, medium-term and long-term goals. So short-term goals might be, I need to buy a new car, so I need to save up some, some cash for that. And just like uh, appraisal, which we talked about, uh, I like SMART goals, so specific, measurable, uh, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. Get these goals down there. Um, you know, medium-term goals might be you want to send the kids to private school. That's going to take a lot of money. So you need a solid financial plan to get that together. And there's obviously lots of aspects to that, but definitely just think about getting a PDP, a financial PDP. And if you're a family like me, um, then we do our family PDP together because if we need to save up for something, you know, tough decisions might need to be made. At, you know, you might have to do something drastic like cancel Netflix to save up the money, which is unthinkable in lockdown. But, uh, you know, if you make those decisions as a family, then that is easier to do. So definitely do that. One component of your financial PDP will be setting a budget. So if, if you don't have a budget for how much you spend, your spending is going to get out of control. And a lot of doctors sort of, you know, we're reasonably well paid. So we don't have to rein in our spending. but Actually, if you if you can save a bit of money, it really mounts up over time. So one of the users of Medics Money contacted us and she was just doing her exams and it was super hectic. So she was spending up to 200 pounds a month on lunch at hospital, okay? Easily done. So she trimmed her, her spend at hospital by 166 pounds a month, okay? So she saved 166 pounds a month. So over her 30 year career, that would add up to 59,000 pounds saved, which is a lot of money. But if you were to invest that money sensibly as part of your financial PDP using a financial advisor, then if it if it compounded at 5%, then actually you'd end up with £139,000 at the end. Um, so just don't underestimate 
uh, making small savings. Uh, and if this is all too much and you're getting overwhelmed already, we have got an ebook which puts all of this together. It's an ebook. Uh, there it is. Um, so you can download that from that link. Uh, and it just goes through it step by step to give you a nice step by step introduction to everything that Medics Money uh, can offer you. Uh, and you've got to do this uh, because, uh, you know, the financial side of things is just not taught to us, but it's incredibly important and about, you know, life changing amounts of money here if you make the right financial decisions. Uh, and the chances are, because you've not had any financial education so far you're probably not making the right financial decisions so that's how medics money can help you uh, and the fourth thing is the nhs pension there's been a tremendous amount of publicity about the nhs pension recently uh, and i'm going to talk about it in a bit more detail uh, later on because it's so important and there's one check that you all need to do right now on your nhs pension and we're going to talk about it really soon but it's incredibly important that you don't just neglect it because it's an incredibly valuable part of your uh, remuneration package it's still a great deal for the vast majority of us but there is one thing that you definitely need to do which we'll talk about in a minute can we move on to the next slide so yeah <clears throat> that was the that's the ebook okay it's totally free you just download it at that link and you know i said we have 18,000 uh, subscribers at medics money so if you're not a subscriber, um, you're running behind, but a way to catch up really nice and quickly is to read the ebook. It's it's a super super succinct run through everything that you need to think about uh, in terms of your per personal finances. So we talk about how to make your PDP, how to get started with investing, how to find the right insurances, we talk a bit about mortgages and pensions. So that's the ebook. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's a really quick skim and it's giving you the big, the biggest wins. In the ebook as well, we talked a bit about tax. So tax rebates is just one part of it. You know, um, you might not be aware if you've got children, you can claim child benefit um, and it starts to taper down at certain income levels between 50 and 60,000, but uh, there's also tax-free childcare. So there's loads of tax efficient ways that you can do because you've worked super hard to earn that money. So you need to try to maximize it if you can. 100% agreed. I think that ebook is super, guys. If you haven't looked at it, please do read it. It's 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 really simply laid out and it's got some super stuff in that there's certainly we hadn't thought about about our own finances and um, certainly that I know that a lot of trainees don't think about when they first jump into the the wide world of general practice and and this kind of stuff really helps and it's something that we didn't have in our own time. So thank you for that, Tommy. I just wanted to the new question. People have said that the code for the card is not working. That's because unfortunately that all ten have ran out now. So we've just we're just busy trying to add another 10 codes in. So if you're trying to get the flashcards and the code's not working, it's because the 10 ran out. So we've just um, just now added another 10. So you can use that same code for another 10. And we have one online course remaining. And I know I've seen your message, Elsa. Um, we have already done that refund. It didn't work for you, so we refunded it back. So number two, do I need an accountant? And how do I find one? Because we had no idea initially. We didn't think about it for a few months into being a GP. What's your advice, Tommy, on this? Yeah, um, can we skip to the next slide? Because before we talk about do I need one, I think it's helpful to think about what accountants can do for us. Uh, so coming at it from a slightly different angle, because, yeah, as you say, lots of us are just not aware of what accountants or financial advisors can do for us. So I've broken this down into, you know, the roles that we've sort of br briefly covered tonight. So if you're a locum GP, OK, we've already covered there's a lot to think about. You, you're basically running a small business, OK? Um, and you need to run the finance of that business very, very well. So my number one advice, if you're a locum GP, is to get a specialist medical accountant. So maybe your friend's brother does accounts for IT contractors, um, and he says that he can help you, okay? Most likely that is not gonna be sufficient. There are quirks to being a GP that your accountant needs to know. There's this whole subspeciality of accountants, which are specialist medical accountants. And again, on Medics Money, we only feature the very best um, specialist medical accountants in the country. And when we first started, uh, we only started with three, but as we've got bigger and bigger, we're now up to 38, I think, at the last count. I've got too many of have forgotten but these are the best of the best and the way that our software works is that we can match your requirements whatever you need um to what to the right accountant for you so we kind of use the concept of triage which we use in medicine all the time to 
effectively triage your requirements as a doctor to the most suitable accountant for you. And I think this kind of comes out from when me and Ed started Medics Money. It started with just us, you know, people realized that me and Ed were okay with our finances and they were asking us, okay, do you know any good accountants? And of course we did. Uh, and so we would say, okay, what are you after? I'm after a pension advice. Okay, well, this is the best accountant for you. Uh, and we wanted to try to keep that, that through into Medics Money at scale. So that's why it works like it does. You tell us what you want uh, and we match you to the best one for you. So yeah, if you're a locum GP, my advice is to seriously just get an accountant. They'll help you with your self-assessment. So self-assessment, as Pooja mentioned earlier, is a way that you pay tax. Thus far, you've probably paid tax automatically via PAYE and you just get a payslip with the tax taken off and nothing more to do. If you're a locum GP, you're going to have to do self-assessment. So you receive your uh, money from the practice or wherever you're working uh, without any tax taken off and you are responsible for telling the inland revenue hmrc uh, how much you earned and working out the tax okay so that's one thing pension forms we, we're going to touch on this pension forms are complicated and if you get it wrong the the you know the problems of that can generate a massive a good specialist medical accountant will know exactly what pension form to fill in uh, and how to do it when to do it and they'll keep you out of trouble uh, a non-specialist accountant most likely will you know that's an area where we see non-specialist accountants make mistakes and when we're getting new accountants on board medics money we really drill down into their pensions knowledge and it's kind of scary what some of them don't know and obviously the ones that don't know don't get to join medics money um, expenses i talked a bit about expenses earlier in terms of tax rebates but when you're a locum gp there's all kinds of things that you can claim uh, tax relief on and it is absolutely vital to do that because that can save you a tremendous amount of money and any money that you can save in tax is you know work that you extra you know extra money that you don't have to work for and over a career that can build up uh, to a tremendous amount and then other things are on the end there IR35 uh, we're not going to get into that tonight but that's important to know about your uh, specialist medical accountant will help you do that Tax planning, super important. You know, you should start to consider your tax bill if relevant as, as a family because there's loads of reliefs that you can use to um, do as a family. So my kids all have a junior stocks and shares ISA. That is a tax-free way for them to build up a nice little fund, um, which hopefully when they're older will have matured into something nice. So there's so many things you can do as a family. And I've put mortgage optimization. I, again, I can't see the chat, but um, I had a quick chat with Pooja in the break, and she said there's lots of questions about um, mortgages and locums, uh, and we're definitely going to get into that later. But uh, if you've got a good accountant, they can make sure that your accounts look right for what your mortgage lender does. So you you were telling your story about how you moved house, I think, just when you CCT'd, was it? or Yeah, soon after. Yeah, I mean, I, I decided to get a mortgage out as I became a GP partner. Um, and obviously that wasn't ideal, but we've been looking for a house for ages. And then all of a sudden I found the perfect house and the perfect job. So I was like, okay, uh, my number one tip is just get a broker. Uh, and obviously that's something that Medics Money offer. But your accountant can also make sure that your accounts look great for the broker. Um, so that's if you're going to go locuming. That's what, what an accountant can do for you. If you're a partner, I'm not going to go into that because you definitely need a specialist medical accountant for that. Um, I've put benchmarking there. That's something that, um, as a practice, we find really useful. So our accountant looks after about 300 uh, other GP practices. So we get to see where we are in terms of our, our other practices. So we can say, oh, look, you know, that we spend 10 times the amount on uh you know toilet roll that the other practice does why that why okay so benchmarking super helpful so if you're a partner you're going to have a specialist medical accountant for sure portfolio gps we've talked a lot about that tonight and a lot of this applies um similarly to the locums how they can help you and then salary gp now if you're a salary gp your finances are pretty straightforward and you're most likely going to be taxed paye so i i think you know if you are a salary gp do you need an accountant I, I think you would benefit from one possibly, but you definitely don't need it. So locum needs it, partner needs it, portfolio needs it. Salaried, I think you could probably do a reasonable job yourself with the right information, which is how medics money uh, you know, can help you. So 
there are some expenses to think about if you're a salary GP and um, home visit mileage. So mileage is super complicated. Ed's written a really good blog on an article, but essentially you can't claim for ordinary commuting. So that is driving from your home to your uh, GP practice, which is your permanent place of work as a salary GP. But you can claim for home visits and if you go on any courses and stuff. So think about that if you're a salary GP. And I put the type two pension form. Um, so your practice manager or uh, finance person at the practice you're working as a salary GP sometimes will do that type two form for you. Um, but thus far, your pension has hopefully just been getting added up automatically as you were a trainee. You need to submit that type two pensions form. Uh, but again, that's not beyond the realms of possibility. It's something that an accountant will do for you. Uh, so I think, you know, if I was going to say which one of those doesn't need an accountant, I would say salary GP, but all of them probably could benefit. And then that brings us on to financial advisors. So all of the financial advisors on Medics Money specialize in doctors and they're all independent. And it's absolutely fundamental to understand how important that independent word is, because Broadly speaking, there's two types of financial advisors. There's restricted advisors and there's independent. So restricted advisors, as the name suggests, usually only advise on a limited number of products. So if you go to buy income protection insurance from them, for example, they might only choose from five providers, okay? They don't choose from the whole market. And so if, you don't, if your criteria don't fit those five providers, then you're not gonna get the best deal. The gold standard is independent financial advice. If you're an independent financial advisor and you go to buy some income protection insurance, that advisor will search the entire market for you and they will give you the best deal for you. So understanding that independent versus restricted distinction is absolutely essential. And when we set up Medics Money, you know, we thought long and hard about using restricted advisors, um, but we ultimately decided that would we recommend restricted advisors to our friends? because that's how Medics Money started, and the answer is no. So we only recommend independent financial advisors on Medics Money. And if you take one thing from tonight, getting your head around that restricted versus independent distinction is absolutely key, because paradoxically, some of the biggest names in that target doctors are restricted. Uh, I won't mention any names, because I imagine that Aman's legal team is about as big as my legal team, um, but just, you know, just think about that, that restricted versus independent thing. So that's what accountants and financial advisors can do for us uh, and who may benefit and what they can add. Then the question is how to find one. And that is exactly why we set up Medics Money because there's so many financial advisors and accountants out there all uh, offering their services, all appearing to be excellent. And it can be super hard to work out who's good and who's not. And that's why we started Medics Money. As I said, it started with me and Ed on a really small scale, just with the friends and friends of friends, people saying, oh, could you have a look at this tax code for me? Or can I claim this? And where can I find a good accountant? Uh, and that has you know, grown into what is Medics Money, where we match your, your criteria to the perfect accountant for you. So um, the other thing about Medics Money is all the reviews are verified by GMC number because Online reviews are great, but the biggest problem is fake reviews. And on Medics Money, all the reviews are verified by GMC registered doctors. So I'm not gonna say that we'll never have a fake review, but we've got some seriously tight safeguards built into our software because we hate fake reviews. Um, so the previous screen, can we just skip back to the previous screen? So if you log on to our site, you'll see this um, and you can put in what you're after, okay? So, you know, you're looking for GP locum accounts. You would tick that box and then you'd hit the next button. So can we go to the next button? And then we would show you, so this search was centered on London, okay? So you'll notice that these accountants are based on London. So this is who we have in London, okay? And then you can click each listing and have a look at the reviews and what they say. Some of them display prices and that's something that we encourage. You know, we encourage openness and transparency from all of them on Medics Money because you know, we want you to have as much information. So if you like the look of the top one, you could click view details. And if we skip to the next slide, you can read the reviews. And as I said, these are all from GMC registered doctors. And then if you like that, you can um, click and they will, uh, you tell them, tell them what you're after and uh, you can book a, a consultation with them. And the whole of Medics Money website is completely free to use. 
uh, because we just want you guys to have the very best chance at managing your finances. And we've been where you are, we are where you are, so we know how difficult it is. So that was like a super quick run through what Medics Money does, because I know it's getting kind of late and my kids will be up in about six or seven hours, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we've got two asleep at the moment and we're just hoping they stay asleep. But that was really useful, actually, because a lot of people don't have accountants and then just choose any accountant when it comes around to filing tax returns and then knowing which one is the right one to choose and which one um, is going to offer them a service as a clinician, know the medical world inside out is really important. So um, certainly encourage you guys to jump on the website and try and find one local to you. Thirdly then, talk to me. Uh, as a new GP, what should I know about the NHS pension? And I know it's a huge topic, um, but what can you summarize for people who are um, currently at the starting point of thinking about issues to do with this? Definitely. So we touched on this earlier. It's an absolutely vast question and we've got loads of resources of about this on Medics Money website. Uh, we did a pensions webinar a couple of weeks ago where 955 doctors turned up to watch live. So we know that this is a massive issue um, for you guys. It's a huge subject. I definitely can't cover it tonight. But what I want to cover tonight is the key points. I mentioned earlier that there is a check that every single one of you now as a GP, even if you're GP ST2, GP ST3, or you've recently qualified, you need to get what's called your total reward statement. OK, so your total reward statement is free. It's available online. I've got the link up on the slide. And that is a summary. Each year you need this statement. OK, so if you're panicking because this is the first time you've heard about a total reward statement, to be honest, you do need to panic, but it is definitely not too late. Right now is a great time to get your total reward statement, okay? And that is a summary of what the NHS pension think you've paid in over the year. And it's really important to check that because often it's not accurate. So when I was an F2, uh, I checked my total reward statement and they had me down, imagine this, they had me down as part-time during my F2 year. Now my F2 year was brutal, man. Uh, it was not part-time. Uh, and if I hadn't have noticed that mistake and corrected it there and then, you know, rolling through, if I noticed it now, 12 years later, correcting it then now would be a nightmare. OK, so you've got to get your total award statement. Um, the NHS pensions website is a great um, resource. Only thing that's better than that website is the Medics Money website, obviously. But no, seriously, the NHS pensions website is great. So get on the total award statement and get your total award statement It's vital OK, to get. Uh, you know, it's a great time to do it. You're starting training, uh, you're starting your career, you finish training, get a summary of where your pension is right now. Um, the other thing that I've put in bold is do not opt out without advice. Now, I'm not a financial advisor. None of what I'm saying is financial advice and should not be construed as such. But the NHS pension is still a great deal for the vast majority of us. And it is a pain to administer. The forms are a nightmare. They're often inaccurate. And you've got to, you know, you've got to pay attention, but it is still a massive part of our remuneration package and it is still a great deal for the vast majority of it. If you have opted out of the NHS pension, and I totally understand why, you know, you can, if you've got cash flow problems, it gives you extra cash flow. But if you have opted out without taking specialist independent financial advice, you need to get some ASAP because that could be a really massive mistake. Um, and the fourth thing I've put on there is get good advice. The NHS pension is so complicated that, you know, there is a very limited number of people that understand it fully in this country. And the majority of people that do understand it fully in this country are on Medics Money, which is great. This is why we started Medics Money. Uh, and the NHS pension is one of the biggest areas where we see non-specialist accountants and non-specialist financial advisors make really massive errors. And it's not because they're bad people. It's just because the NHS pension is so complicated uh, and they underestimate its complexity. So if, I, if you take one thing out of this slide it is get your total award statement. That is the, the summary of your pension for the last year. And if you haven't got anything more than that, then the NHS uh, pension website they will send you a statement. It takes a little while and then check that statement very carefully uh, against your records to make sure that the numbers are right. Because if you correct it now, it's going to be relatively easy, although mine's been inaccurate for a while and it's been a nightmare. But luckily, my accountant's sorting it out. Uh, but if you leave it late and you don't correct it now, big problems. So just get your total award statement, definitely. 
Uh, and that's very sound advice. I certainly still find the NHS pension process very complicated. And I, I would certainly recommend going onto the Medics Money website and reading the free blogs that they have there. It's very useful to have it broken down into manageable chunks of information. So I suppose, Tommy, moving on, having set up Medics Money, what is the most important thing that you didn't think of as a GP trainee? Yeah, that is a massive question. Um, you know, I never wanted to be a gypsy in dermatology. I did it because um, I sort of, my career led me that way. I never wanted to start something like Medics Money, but both me and Ed are so passionate about, you know, educating our colleagues on finances. And, and we see all the time we get people that write to us and say, oh, we used your guide. And we saved like three grand. Someone sent me a photo of a brand new bike that they brought the other day with their tax rebate. And I just felt, it just feels amazing to do that. It's totally free, download the guide. And we hook people up with the best accountants in the country. And they just send us little messages that really motivates us. But I think, you know, there's been so much amazing advice from, you know, both you and uh, Aman tonight. But I think the one thing that, you know, really sticks with me that you said is passion, and or a plan like i said i never had a plan to start medics money but i was super passionate about helping our friends and actually i sat on it for about five years because i just didn't think that i could do it or that we could do it and then we finally decided to do it and you know it's absolutely exploded because i think everybody recognizes that there's a massive need for it so follow your passions you can have a plan if that if you do but you know if you don't you don't uh, and the other thing i think is I wouldn't say don't follow the herd, uh, but if you've got something which you know no one else is doing, um, don't be afraid. And you believe that it's a good thing. You know, no one else has ever done what Medics Money are doing, uh, but we really believed in it, and you know, it's it's really worked out really really well. So just if you believe it's a good thing, give it a go. Hundred percent. I think, um, and now people are at that stage of the career now where you've kind of been jumping through hoops, you've kind of been told what to do and where to go, but it's now you've reached that point that you probably got into GP training for that that ability to choose and take some opportunities that perhaps you didn't have time and energy to before and just jump in because you never know where you're going to end up and what you guys are doing at Medics Money is amazing. Um, and there are so many stories of of GPs these days who are doing amazing, amazing things um, and you're at that, that point now where you can start to make the decisions to put time and effort into... Um, these kind of new ventures that that hopefully will blow up just like yours did to Tommy at some point. So thank you so much for your time, Tommy. If you can stick around for the questions, that'd be really useful because there are quite a few that have come through. Uh, but I do realize it's getting on a little bit. So if people need to um, to head off, thank you so much for your time for with being us tonight. We're going to stick around and try and answer every question that's come in. But I appreciate it's gone a little bit beyond what we said. So thank you so much. So we're going to go a little bit silent now where we go back to the beginning and just pick these questions out. Tommy, are you okay to stick, stick behind and, and answer anything that is targeted to yourself? Yeah, definitely. I'm going in blind because I can't see any of the questions. Yeah, we'll so be, it's going to be like quick fire we'll for me on the spot. I like it. <laughs> Brilliant. Just give us two seconds, guys, where we're going to go to the beginning and we, we'll be back in a second. But thank you so much for your time.